Hello watch lovers, welcome back to the channel and boy do we have a treat for you today. This is Matt's watch, it's a 1941 Omega chronograph, reference CK2393 for those interested in that. And this is a very valuable watch and a very rare watch, especially in this condition. See the case is uh, solid uh, 18k gold. It's uh, got some use marks for sure. And I'm not entirely sure about the finishing. I don't actually think that's uh, factory original, but uh, it looks very good. See the chronograph works. And that uh, black gilt dial is in really good condition for the age. So let's uh, open this beauty up and see what we have inside. And look at that. See the watch was given as a gift most likely in 1941. On the first day of the year even. It's a kind of a New Year's present for some lucky person. Now it's Matt's. And yeah, that makes him a lucky person. The mechanism is a little bit uh, odd. You actually have to disassemble part of it to get uh, the movement out of the case. After taking out the case screws, we're going to take out the reset lever here. And then we're going to take off uh, the operating lever. We first release the spring. And the reset pusher is secured uh, much in the same way as a crown with a little uh, screw. So with that screw released, we can then push the movement out of the case. A bit strange. Over-engineered? Yeah, probably. Not entirely straightforward for sure. That lever we have here is actually part of the reset lever with that spring as well. It's in the side of the movement, which is uh, quite unique. And so is the dial. It has been a double gilt. So you have the regular yellow gold, but then also some uh, more copperish uh, gold. We can see it's also got a lot of different scales. I honestly don't uh, recognize all of them or haven't really researched that, but the telemetry scale, the tachymeter scale is uh, of course there. And then we can put the dial away in this little box so we uh, don't risk any damage to it. Before turning the movement over, we have to take off this cannon pinion. That is basically what connects the train side of the movement uh, to the dial side. So this is a chronograph movement, which means it has a stop uh, watch uh, function. And um, it operates with a lot of different levers and springs. And the first thing we always want to do is to take uh, the tension off the springs and thus also off the levers. When uh, removing those springs, it's important uh, not to grab them in uh, the thin part, because then they can easily uh, bend or be distorted or broken even. And uh, what you will also see is that I uh, put the screws for most of these back into the screw hole right away. Because, uh, yes, it's very easy to uh, mix up screws. And that is uh, one of the absolutely most common questions or comments I see in the comment field. How do you remember where everything goes? And yeah, might as well uh, make it easier to remember. And about here we encounter the first problem. That jewel is chipped. So we're gonna have to uh, work on that a little bit later. For now let's uh, continue the disassembly. And yes, taking things apart is uh, generally not too difficult. For uh, watches it's mostly held down with uh, screws. Then you have a few things that are press fit into place. So basically with the friction. And then occasionally you see uh, super glue and duct tape. And those swatches you should stay away from. Actually glue does have a certain role in uh, watchmaking, uh, but mostly for crystals. 
we're now down to the base movement. So I'm uh, letting the power out of the mainspring. That's to uh, make sure we don't have any uh, parts flying around. That uh, golden colored wheel on top of that uh, big plate is uh, the chronograph driving wheel, which we take off with a special tool. And what this tool does is that it uh, safely holds the wheel while it presses against the main plate and then uh, lifts the wheel off. So that way we can uh, do it without any uh, damage to the wheel or the pivot. We can then take the balance out. The balance is kind of the beating heart of a mechanical watch. When the balance oscillates back and forth quite rapidly, 18,000 times per hour for this old watch, it's very important that the balance uh, has a uniform weight distribution. And all those little screws around the rim of it uh, is to uh, make it possible to adjust that. As we took the pallet fork out, we see that uh, the train of wheels is still spinning a little bit. So that means there's still some uh, blockage, some dirt, and even a little hair, actually. And we can uh, see that the movement is quite stained as well. They made these movements in a few different uh, finishes and uh, materials, plating, that kind of thing. Uh, this was before Omega started with uh, copper plating their movements. So this specific movement uh, also came in the rhodium plated uh, version and also uh, gold plated, I believe. Well, we see there's still quite a lot of power here. Huh? All right, safe to take uh, that cock off and still some power. So yeah, it's been a really long time since this uh, movement has been serviced, as we'll also see a little bit later. But it is a very solidly built movement. Not a lot of stamped out cheap metal parts, as uh, you find more and more nowadays, obviously. And we see there's a lot of dirt also for the screws. So we're going to clean uh, them as well. Really stained uh, that old uh, metal here. And we're not going to be able to get all this staining off over the eight or so decades since this watch was uh, made. The metal has reacted with uh, oxygen, with the air, with uh, different kinds of uh, lubricants, that kind of thing. So uh, some staining will remain, but we'll uh, get most of it off. So we're back on the dial side. We're going to take off uh, the keyless works. Those are the parts that allow us to wind the watch and also to set the time. The motion works. It's all uh, connected on this side of the movement. So while I'm taking off the remaining few parts and uh, pre-cleaning uh, the movement, uh, let's also talk a little bit about uh, the history of uh, this movement and uh, the companies. I've uh, spoken a few other videos about uh, how the different parts of the world approached uh, watchmaking. The English or the British uh, were very much focused on uh, handmade pieces, low volumes, uh, high luxury prestige and so forth. The Americans were the ones who started really industrializing uh, watchmaking and uh, streamlining uh, production, making parts that were interchangeable and so forth. And uh, after the First World War, the uh, Swiss were getting a little bit worried, seeing that their uh, more traditional ways of uh, making watches uh, started becoming a little bit less uh, feasible. So they really needed to uh, be more industrialized, to be more streamlined and so forth. The big dog was uh, Omega. And the Tissot was uh, one of the other uh, more industrialized and modern uh, companies at the time. So in 1928, uh, these two companies decided to uh, either merge or form a holding company. And they chose the latter. And that became the Société Suisse pour l'Industrie Horlogère. I'll say that quickly 10 times. Go! And those two uh, recruited uh, Le Mania, very famous uh, chronograph maker at the time. And uh, the SSIH, these three companies uh, then uh, formed, uh, became the mainstay of uh, the Swiss watch industry. 
There was a second uh, holding company as well that was formed, uh, focusing uh, somewhat more on uh, the movement side of things. The Algen. Yeah, shut up now, dog. I'm trying to say this, okay? I need to concentrate. The Allgemeine Schweizerische Uhrenindustrie. Ooh, tongue twister. By the way, we see that uh, the crown wheel here on the underside of this uh, three-quarter plate is really stuck due to old dirt. So yeah. Just to finish off uh, the history here then. So uh, SSIH and Aswag. Aswag uh, kind of became uh, ETA. And uh, SSIH kind of became the Swatch Group. A bit simplified, of course, but uh, that's more or less the lines. We're getting pretty much all the parts laid out. Not a crazy amount of parts, but uh, still enough to uh, make me uh, sure I keep my tongue in my own mouth. Yeah, no, that's not really a saying, but I'm a married man, so, you know, sometimes. Anyway, we're... Uh, Almost there. We just need to take uh, the mainspring out of the barrel. And uh, what we're going to see here is that this mainspring uh, is probably older than me. And yeah, I'm not quite 82 years old, but uh, this is not a new mainspring. We can see it's got the spiral shape that uh, perhaps... Uh, Logically, you would think that mainsprings have, but nowadays they're actually uh, S-shaped. And the reason is that that uh, provides a more uniform power as it uh, unwinds. And there we have it. All the parts laid out, ready for the cleaning machine. And now you don't really need a cleaning machine for uh, cleaning watch parts. Uh, you can do it with some uh, lighter fluid or uh, alcohol, that kind of thing. I'd recommend not using your best malt, but otherwise uh, there are options. When you do a lot of this work, then the cleaning machine really helps. An automatic one like this one is quite expensive, but uh, if you do a lot of it, you save a lot of time. Alright, remember this. This is the jewel for uh, the chronograph wheel, and uh, we have to uh, replace it. So the first thing is to press the jewel out of the current setting. What the? And to do that we use this uh, jewel press. It's uh, from Horia, and typically just called the Horia tool. But you have a lot of different sizes of these uh, pushers and anvils, so that uh, really helps. Expensive tool, but nowadays you can get uh, clone tools uh, on AliExpress for a lot better price. With the jewel out we then have to measure it to see uh, what kind of replacement size we need to get. And yeah, these are small things. Make sure it lies flat so we get the right measurement. And it measures 1.2 millimeters. Now there's also a hole in the jewel, of course, for uh, the pivot on the chronograph wheel. So we're going to measure that as well. And that seems to be 0 0.21 millimeters. And since I'm based in Switzerland, I just drop by the nearest gas station and they uh, sell uh, hundreds of these jewels, obviously. Duh! Anyway, before getting back to the jewel, let's also uh, go to uh, have a look at the case. Matt uh, doesn't want any polishing or anything done to the case, so we're just going to clean it. In general, uh, we want to be very careful polishing gold anyway, because of course you do remove material and gold is uh, relatively uh, valuable, I've been told. But a lot of uh, collectors really want their uh, watches as original as possible. So we're just gonna run it through the ultrasonic.
And if you haven't seen his videos before, then uh, I suggest uh, being cautious with the volume now as we go to the ultrasonic. All right, so this old mainspring is uh, not really that uh, good anymore. I somehow misplaced my uh, pre-service uh, time graph um, video, but it did uh, not have very good amplitude. Uh, it looked actually pretty good otherwise, but uh, understandably not very good with this old mainspring. So uh, I assume that uh, most people understood I was just making a really lame joke about uh, Swiss gas stations and uh, watch jewels. The thing is that uh, with these old watches it's getting uh, more and more difficult to get uh, parts. That jewel size I just uh, measured is uh, not readily available. And the same thing with the mainspring. We might have to find a mainspring that uh, has a little bit uh, different measurements. So a little bit different thickness, different length, uh, different height and so forth. And sometimes uh, we see that uh, the barrel arbor won't really fit that well. So we see it's very tight to get it uh, into the inner coil of uh, the mainspring. And that little uh, hook on uh, the barrel arbor doesn't really fit into the eye of uh, the inner end of the mainspring. So when this happens, I uh, use a pin vise to uh, grab the square part of uh, the barrel arbor. And then you can twist it so that uh, the barrel arbor's hook fits into the eye of the mainspring. And there we have it. With that, we can put uh, the lid back on and then uh, press it on with another tool. And yeah, I said it before, watchmakers are tool junkies. All right, with a barrel and a new mainspring ready, let's turn to the balance. Now this is an old watch from 1941, before uh, shock settings became uh, mainstream. They did actually introduce uh, Inca block shock springs uh, for this uh, movement, just a year after this one, so in 1942. But for this one and a lot of other old uh, movements, we have to first take the balance off the cock, and then we can unscrew the capstone from uh, the underside. It's a little bit extra work. So the escapement of the watch is the balance together with uh, the pallet fork and escape wheel. And uh, these are the fastest moving parts. So uh, to try to make the lubrication stay uh, more or less in place, we're gonna put uh, these uh, parts into something we call Epilam. The product name I'm using is called Fixodrop, and uh, what uh, Epilam is or does is that it leaves a very thin film on the surface of these parts, and that film uh, stops lubrication from creeping, so that it stays a bit more in place and thus provides better lubrication over time. So you'll notice that I'm not going to soak the pallet fork, I'm just going to basically dip the pallet uh, jewels into the fixer drop. And then I'm putting all the pivots into this uh, pith wood to uh, clean the pivots so that uh, there's no residue left on them. That residue might then come off and interfere with uh, the movement later. So when we then put a tiny little drop of oil in the center of the capstone, it will bead up and stay more put, and thus uh, provide better lubrication. Now these screws are tiny. That is the screw right there. And if we zoom in a little bit more, this screwdriver is actually 0.6 millimeters wide. Yeah, not uh, big things. The only things that are big on watchmakers are uh, their muscles. Well, not the only thing. Anyway, this is a Breguet overcoil uh, hairspring. 
So it's a little bit extra tricky sometimes to uh, get in the right spot. And yes, you might ask yourself, uh, what's a little bit extra tricky? Yeah, beats me. I do not know whether there is a connection between my mouth and my brain sometimes or... Anyway, we managed to get the uh, balance uh, back together, so we can start uh, reassembling uh, the movement. And we can see that uh, the plates uh, did uh, clean up uh, quite well. Not uh, entirely. And if you're wondering uh, if it's uh, possible or maybe even a good idea sometimes to, uh, let's say, refinish uh, the movements, no, it's not. There are a few reasons for that, uh, perhaps chief among them, that uh, it just isn't uh, worth it. It would take much more time than anything else. Now, before continuing uh, that line of thought, uh, let's just leave a shout out to this uh, fantastically made uh, crown wheel. 80 years ago, and they made a crown wheel like that. Quite amazing. So getting back to uh, the refinishing of uh, the movement uh, question. There are very small tolerances uh, as well in uh, watches. We're talking about uh, fragments of a millimeter. And uh, when you uh, refinish metal, you do remove it. You do remove the top part of the metal. So uh, that's the second reason why uh, refinishing a movement isn't really feasible. Yes, you can... Uh, Perhaps take out some uh, staining, take out some oxidation, uh, that type of thing, but that's uh, more or less it. Of course, you can replay it if you want. All right, with all uh, the wheels in place, we can then put this uh, three quarter plate back on. We always want to make sure we uh, don't screw things tightly down until we are very sure all the parts that should run freely do so. All right, let's see if it uh, runs freely. And uh, content with that, we turn the movement over. We're first going to put the cannon pinion back on. That one is friction fit, so we press it down. And the thing we press it down on is uh, the uh, center wheel on the other side. So that then transfers the power from uh, the center wheel to the dial side. So whenever the center wheel uh, moves, uh, then uh, the cannon pinion will also move. Now the reason it's friction fit is because uh, it also carries the minute hand. And we need to be able to set that with the crown. So when we turn the crown in time setting position, the friction is overcome and we can then turn the hands. Pretty uh, cool way of doing it. Someone was really smart back in the old days. Now I'm going to show you uh, a problem that is uh, relatively common. It uh, happens uh, sometimes if you don't uh, look out and think. And that problem is this screw here. You can see the screw tip is not level with the surface. So that's going to create problems for us uh, when we try to put on uh, the rest of the parts. So I simply use the wrong screw on uh, the train side. You will see sometimes that uh, one of the screws is uh, shorter than the others for the bridge uh, screws. And the shorter one then typically goes uh, next uh, to the crown. So after swapping the right screw with the wrong screw, we can then uh, continue. Not too much uh, happening, of course, on the dial side of this movement. There's no date, there's no calendar, no uh, hour counter. So just uh, the keyless works and the motion works. Now, given that there's uh, quite a lot of uh, moving parts uh, in the watch, and some of them uh, don't really move without uh, quite a lot of force applied, so typically the ones uh, in the keyless works where you uh, pull the crown out and then there's a lot of friction, then you have to lubricate those parts. And we're using very little lubrication. 
Lubrication is extremely expensive, but uh, that's not the main reason we're using little of it. The main reason we're using little of it is because we don't want uh, lubrication to, let's say, roam freely inside the watch. It might not sound like a problem, or it might even sound like a benefit uh, to have a lot of oil inside the watch. But the thing is that dirt and debris will uh, get stuck in the oil, in the lubrication. And then the lubricant goes from uh, lubricating to uh, basically being uh, sort of an abrasive. And that's when you get uh, serious wear. Secondly, it's also worth noting that uh, the wheels uh, in a watch are cut in a way so that they do not rub on each other. They actually roll on each other. So there's no need for any oil on the teeth themselves. So we're almost ready with the uh, base movement. We're uh, putting the pallet fork back in and then we're going to lubricate the pallets and uh, the escape wheel. Going to give it a little bit of a wind just to make sure that the pallet fork uh, goes from side to side. So the escape wheel is on the right there. You see every time we move the pallet fork, the escape wheel escapes a little bit each time. So what we do, we put a tiny little uh, bead of oil on the surface of uh, the pallet stone there. And this time we're doing it on the entry pallet stone. You might have noticed that uh, the layout of this movement is a uh, little bit uh, different from uh, what you might be mostly used to and what I'm mostly used to. So for this one it's uh, simply more convenient to uh, oil the entry pallet. doesn't really matter. The uh, main uh, purpose is to uh, spread the oil over the escape wheel teeth and also over the pallets. All right. Then we can put the balance in and see if uh, we can get this baby running again. So we're going to put it on the time grapher to see uh, how it works. First give it a good wind. And then we oil all the different uh, pivots. And we're first going to demagnetize the movement and then uh, put it on a time grapher. On the time grapher, uh, we first of all want to see straight lines, which we see here. Then we just need to uh, adjust the movement a little bit to uh, make sure that the timekeeping is, uh, is good. We saw it was running way too fast initially. But with a little bit of adjustment back and forth, we managed to get it uh, to just a few seconds plus per day, which is uh, what we're looking for. This looks uh, really good. It is a high quality movement, so uh, not surprising, but uh, still pretty cool to see. All right, then let's get on with the chronograph parts. First thing we're going to put on is the chronograph driving wheel. This one is also press fit onto uh, the extended pivot of the fourth wheel. Always have to be careful, we don't uh, get any sideways uh, pressure on it. So that's why I'm using a hand press for it. It works all right. The main concept of a chronograph is that uh, you're able to uh, engage and disengage the stopwatch function. And of course, first of all, uh, the stopwatch function has to get the power from somewhere, and that's then from this uh, chronograph driving wheel. 
Secondly, you have to be able to uh, control, of course, the start and stop and uh, reset of the chronograph. And that's this column wheel that we just put in now. And this is a jumper for the column wheel. It makes sure that the column wheel uh, doesn't uh, float around freely. And then once you have uh, that as the controlling uh, mechanism, then uh, you want to be able to uh, engage and disengage, basically have a sort of clutch function, if you will, between the driving wheel and the counting wheels. There's pretty much always a central seconds counting wheel, which we then simply call the chronograph wheel. And that was the one uh, where the jewel was damaged. So let's uh, first uh, have a look at the replacement jewel. So we measured the jewel and we measured the pivot on the chronograph wheel. And uh, the chronograph wheel pivot was 0 0.21 millimeters. So the jewel hole has to be slightly wider than uh, the pivot uh, size, of course. But it also shouldn't be so wide that uh, we get an issue with uh, the side shake. And this looks uh, just fine. There is a measurement rule of thumb as well. So the hole size should be between one tenth and one twentieth more than uh, the pivot. So this hole should then be, let's say, between 0 0.22 and 0 0.23 millimeters. So we can then put uh, the jewel into uh, the cock. And then we're going to use our Horia tool again to uh, press it into the right spot. Now exactly what uh, depth should be pressed into is uh, not always entirely clear. But as a general rule, you want it to be uh, flush with the underside of the cock. Another thing with this one is that uh, the jewel has an extra bearing inside uh, the cock. And uh, we need to make sure that bearing is also then flush. Or flush-ish. All right, looks okay. Well, a little bit more then. Okay. So then we can put uh, the counting wheel in, the chronograph wheel. This is the minute counting wheel. We're going to lubricate those uh, heart shaped cams on top because we're going to use them when we uh, do the reset. And with a new jewel in place, we can then put uh, the chronograph cock back on. As you might see, there's uh, an intermediate wheel as well between uh, the chronograph wheel, which counts the seconds, and the minute wheel, which counts the minutes. Now here's a question for everyone. Why is there an intermediate minute wheel? What's the purpose of that? Comment below, let me know. So conceptually, the chronograph isn't that complicated, but uh, it will be a little bit more complicated once you start putting in some, uh, let's say, uh, nice things to have. Like what we just put on now is uh, the brake, this one. And what it does is that it uh, arrests the chronograph wheel whenever we push uh, the pause button. You could uh, get along without uh, the brake, but uh, then you might run the risk that uh, the chronograph uh, wheel would start moving about a little bit and that's just unsightly. And of course not great if you want to time keep uh, something uh, important. Now we're putting in a very vital part. This is uh, the clutch wheel. The clutch, you can see it moves back and forth. It's always uh, meshing with the chronograph driving wheel. But when we then move it, it also starts meshing with the chronograph wheel and thus uh, running the chronograph counting. Well, you can see right now it will not mesh with the chronograph wheel and that's because it simply butts into uh, one of the columns on the column wheel. And that is then uh, how the column wheel actually uh, controls all the different operations. If the column wheel is rotated a little bit, then you would see that uh, the beak on the clutch would uh, fit into the gaps between two of the columns and uh, thus uh, you would be able to mesh uh, the chronograph uh, wheel with the clutch. Here we're putting in the hammer. The hammer has uh, two surfaces that uh, hits those hard chip cams on top of the counting wheels. 
And the hammer, of course, does that when we want to reset those wheels. So that's when we push uh, the reset button. It forces uh, the wheels to rotate back to the, uh, let's say, original position. So as you might uh, guess, this is then the position where we actually place the hands for the counter wheels on zero. All right, we're almost done with the chronograph parts as well. We put in the jumper for the minute wheel. And then we remember that there are a couple of parts that go into the side of the movement. So we have to put uh, them in. And then we can put the movement back in the case. There's a little uh, guide pin to help uh, line everything up in the case. So we have to make sure that one falls into the right slot. So we're going to protect uh, the dial side with uh, the crystal. So uh, let's uh, turn to the crystal. Just make sure that we can take out the small scratches there are in it. You can do this with a few different products. And a really fine abrasive will do. I'm using a polywatch here, but uh, yeah, and a very fine abrasive uh, will do the same job. So with that, uh, with the crystal back in the bezel, we can then use that to protect the dial side of the watch as we uh, put in the last few parts of the chronograph movement. So as I mentioned initially, it's a bit peculiar that this uh, operating lever here actually has a pin that goes into the pusher. It's certainly one way to keep the pusher uh, in place, but also a bit strange. But also the whole shape of the lever is also very uh, unusual. This one pushes straight in. Well, uh, nowadays uh, most uh, operating levers are uh, long and pivoted to give more uh, force, basically. This is the spring that uh, makes sure that uh, the operating lever doesn't get stuck, but that it uh, is pressed back out again, basically. And then we see it working on the bottom part of uh, the column wheel. Then for the reset lever, right next to the tweezer there, is a pin that is uh, then pressed on by that lever in the side of the movement when you then press the reset button. A little bit uh, odd, but uh, does work. Not the most uh, convenient way of doing it, uh, I would say, for uh, modern movements. But then again, the whole layout of this movement is uh, not very modern. We're testing that everything uh, works as it should. And we're going to do some more lubrication, especially of uh, the column wheel and the levers. All right, let's uh, then run the chronograph a little while and see uh, if it runs as it should. There are a few things we're looking for. Uh, maybe first of all, let's look at uh, the flip over of the minute counter. That little finger on the chronograph wheel should basically just once touch the intermediate minute counting wheel. And we see here it touches twice. So that means we have to increase the distance between the chronograph uh, wheel and the intermediate uh, minute wheel. And after making that small adjustment, we see uh, that the finger touches the intermediate uh, counting wheel once. And that's how it should be. Now the thing is, with uh, really old uh, movements like this, it might be that some of those teeth on the intermediate counting wheel are a little bit deformed or worn. And given that uh, the distances are very, very small, it might be that we uh, end up in a situation where the little finger on the chronograph wheel will butt onto the tip of a, a tooth. So that can happen. So we might have to go back and forth a few times to uh, try to make it uh, exactly right. But that's of course part of uh, being a watchmaker. Oh, speak of the devil. 
So what we do when this happens is that we adjust uh, what's called eccentrics. Those uh, look like screws, but they actually then uh, allow us to change the distance between the different wheels. And that distance we call depthing. All right, with the depthing uh, corrected, let's then have a look at uh, the crown. Because uh, Matt is, uh, of course, uh, a bit of an enthusiast, and he also wants to make sure that the crown is the correct one. The crown that was on the watch is not the correct one, uh, but uh, Matt managed to find the correct one. So let's uh, put it on. What we see is that uh, the correct crown actually uh, goes a little bit further in than the old one. So what do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you, what do you do if uh, you need basically a longer stem? Well, there are stem extensions that you can use, but uh, for cases like this, where it's just uh, maybe half a millimeter, we can simply fill a little bit of uh, metal uh, filings, metal shavings into the crown. And that will allow us to basically backfill uh, the inner end to achieve the correct length. And when we have verified that uh, the length is uh, the good one, then we use some uh, Loctite to make sure that the crown doesn't unscrew uh, by itself. And then we're ready to go. Last thing we need to do, of course, is to put on the dial and the hands. And that really is a spectacular dial. These old watches uh, are typically holding the hands in place with uh, dog screws that sort of cut into the dial fit from the underside of the movement. What you do is you unscrew those uh, dog screws to uh, pull uh, the dial a little bit tighter into the movement. Another issue that is uh, relatively common with uh, these old uh, movements is uh, that the tubes for the hands are a little bit too uh, wide, too loose. So it's easy to take uh, the hands on and off. So what we're going to do, we're going to use another tool. Yes, I told you. Watchmakers are tool junkies. We use all our profits to buy new tools that we might use maybe once in a year maybe once in two years and then we're really happy because we actually finally used that tool we bought this tool uh, helps us uh, squeeze the tube a little bit tighter it is actually a very good tool the old-fashioned way of doing this would be to uh, put uh, the hand the tube into uh, a collet in a lathe and then tighten it a little bit but this tool is uh, much more controlled in how much uh, force you use so with that small adjustment, we can uh, put the hands back on. Again, there are some marks on uh, the hands and that's uh, fine. Matt wants to keep it uh, as it is and uh, fully respect that. Those who have uh, watched the channel know that uh, I'm generally uh, not a fan of making old things look new. I think old things should look old, maybe better, but they should still look their age. Now for the chronograph seconds hand, we also have the same issue actually. We can see that uh, the hand does not reset to the same place every time. And if we move it a little bit, then we can see that it moves on the pivot. And uh, there can be a couple of uh, reasons for that. One can be that the hammer doesn't uh, lock tightly enough on uh, the hard shape cam. But for this one, it's simply that uh, the hand uh, tube is a little bit too loose. And there's actually quite a lot of force from the hammer when it hits uh, the hard shaped cam. And if uh, the hand uh, tube is a little bit loose, 
then the hand will uh, jiggle ever so slightly on the pivot. So same tool, same solution. Let's then uh, run the chronograph for a few minutes and then uh, try to reset it. We want to reset it uh, when it's about uh, halfway through a cycle. And the reason is that uh, that is when the heart-shaped cam is uh, with a pointy end towards the hammer, which is the trickiest place. If the hammer has any irregularities, it will not reset properly. So let's see. And there we can see the force. You see how uh, the second sand uh, vibrates for a really short time after you reset it. On with the crystal and on with the case back. And we're going to put uh, the strap back on and enjoy this fantastic watch for a few seconds ourselves before handing it back off to Matt. Before seeing the watch on the wrist, just want to remind everyone that at uh, vintagewatchservices.eu you will always find uh, more than 100 fantastic uh, vintage watches. And as a YouTube subscriber, you can get 10% off. And there we have it. Matt's 1941 solid gold Omega chronograph with a legendary 33.3 movement inside and an original buckle as well. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then uh, click subscribe so you can uh, see more videos when they uh, are published. We'll be back shortly with another video. Until then... Ta-ta!